Uh, thank you very much for having me here. It's always been exciting to be able to share my journey with a lot of you. And it's also quite um, difficult, this, this particular speech, very difficult, because when you are pre-labeled to come here, then you have certain, you know, bar that you have to try to reach, and that's really difficult. So let me introduce you to this wonderful girl. She's really awesome and cool. Not. That's me. And I am uh, really socially challenged when I was very little. And I always tell my mom that, hey, mom, you know, if you stop cutting my hair like that, or maybe um, uh, uh, give me nicer clothes, maybe, you know, uh, make me fatter, maybe, you know, I would have friends. And she tells me, ah, how does that make you feel socially not having enough friends? I don't know, horrible, bad, uncomfortable, terrible, I, I hate it. And she says, then I can tell you a story. Then she will tell me a story. So this story goes into about how a caterpillar will go into a cocoon and they will build this nice cocoon around themselves and then they will digest themselves, <laughs> digest, and turn themselves into this soup, which is actually a high enzyme of soy, and then which will then build them into a body of something, and then they come out beautiful butterfly. And she says, wait, you won't be a butterfly. And I'm like, uh, okay, but can, do we have to go through the difficult part? And she said, if you didn't go through the difficult part, you aren't growing. Now, to a lot of people, my life really does look like I've just turned or blossomed or, or, or grew into a butterfly, you know, from, from really socially challenged to meeting Tun to doing television to meeting Gong Li and meeting my husband and marrying him and etc. But how did this happen? Where is my caterpillar in the cocoon story? What is that story? So, I started as a radio DJ. I was on air, but it's actually I was hired to do a daytime DJ slot, but then they found that my vocabulary from Sekolah Kebangsaan wasn't enough. So I had to do the midnight shift instead, which I said, yeah, okay, bring it on. Every single time when I say Wednesday and everybody will look at me and say, you are Wednesday. Okay, fine, Wednesday. But you learn. And I sleep about maybe say three to four hours a day. And I feel that as I was going through my journey, um, of being on radio and then after that on television, the one thing that I keep facing or keep going through or keep coming back to is that I feel like I'm always in a cocoon. I feel like it's always uncomfortable. I feel like it's always painful that it is always... When does it get easy? When is that saying that says, you know, start difficult and then later on it's going to be easy? When does that happen? When is that later on? When, when does that happen? So, this is what I found out. It doesn't. Because the point is that you constantly need to challenge yourself, you need to ask yourself, how can you do this better? When we were doing 3R, which is a women empowerment program on television, on TV3, uh, it was one of those days, which is back in 2000, in the year 2000, where television is the stuff that people watch anyway. Um, they, we were not just doing a show where we talk about how you put on makeup. We were talking, we were doing a show where we talk about, where we were challenging parents, asking parents, why do you talk to your daughter this way? And why do you talk to your boys this way? We're doing a show where we talk about, hey, how do you stop men from harassing you? We're talking about telling men, hey, do you want to consider looking at girls differently? maybe from the inside out instead of the other way in. And we constantly ask ourselves, how do we do this better? And if you can see, right, it was black and white uh, newspaper reporting at first and now suddenly it's coloured. Because suddenly, four years later, four years after we were on air when we were doing television show, we are recognised as a good show. But that took us four years. And every single day in those four years, after we do a recording, after we do a show, we will sit around a table and we'll ask ourselves, how can we do this better? What is it we want to say? How can we do this different? How do you want to say what we want to say and make a difference? Hey, maybe it's not enough that we're doing this on television. Hey, maybe it is more. We need to do more. Maybe we need to be on the ground. We need to be talking to girls. We need to talk to women. We need to talk to policymakers. We need to talk to different people so that they understand what other girls are going through and real change can happen. But this is not an overnight 
thing. You know what? You don't know what you don't know. We go around talking about reproductive system. We go around teaching girls how to do self defense. We do more than just television show. And not because we're paid to do it, but because we think, hey, if you want to really make something or do something that matters, then you're going to do whatever it takes. So four years later, when we were finally recognized with an Asian Television Award, we're now getting that attention from different countries. And we have three R Philippines, we have three R Thailand, we have three R Jakarta. Uh, they're all different girls. We don't speak all those different languages, all the same languages. And I, I, I get Siti Nohaliza's attention, and I get to act alongside Nicholas Saputra, which is Ada Apu Dengan Cinta. Uh, those were really cool and great stuff. I mean, I enjoyed them very much. But it also attracted a lot of the other stuff. Like, for example, hey, Yuan, you are, we heard that you are the ones who get paid the most money, so why is that so? To, hey, I think, you know, I need to be more popular, I need to be more famous. It, 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 maybe it's about me, I need to go harder. Uh, uh, I had an idea that being famous means certain things, but maybe when I'm famous, I could do more things. There's a sense of hollowness. And then I decided to tell my own story. So this is what I did. And this film won a couple of awards. That was during the time when there was a huge movement amongst young people because of the democratization of uh, filmmaking, that you're able to make film because it's a lot cheaper and easier and accessible nowadays because, you know, with a smaller camera, you can make film. And then I suddenly discovered a different side of voice. I suddenly asked different kind of question. It is no longer about, hey, how do I make myself more famous? Who cares? It's really now, how do I make my work? How do I make the shows that I'm creating, the films that I'm making, the TV shows that I'm making, you know, make a difference? How do I get that out there and touch someone and have that effect? Because, you know, the media is a huge platform. How am I supposed to do that? So those are the questions that I'm constantly asking myself. And it has been a difficult um, um, uh, process because I'm not a filmmaker student. I graduated in biology and chemistry. And so constantly, people are asking, so you don't know filmmaking what? How you know what to direct? Huh? You don't direct the what? Fine! I will go take a filmmaking course, which is why I did. I got a scholarship from Big Communications and I went over to Melbourne, Museum of Melbourne, and I came back with filmmaking. Did I learn more? Well, I guess, but I would have learned it anyway, so yeah. I made some... Um, but to be, I made some discovery about myself along the way. And it is that when you ask difficult questions, you have to take difficult steps. You have to do the things that really, really hurt, that, you know, makes you really, really uncomfortable. For example, I love acting, but I don't do enough acting because I don't have the standard of how an actress will look like. I have been turned down so many times during auditions because of the way I look. And um, the point is, I could just say, yeah, this is such a stereotypical industry, or I could just keep knocking and just keep going and just keep saying that, you know, I could be that girl who could make that difference. Um, and I could break that stereotype. When I look at this, the one thing that I really felt bad was that it's like I was making up for the lack of, like if you see my hair grew more and more and more, it's like it's used to make up the lack of confidence that I have in myself or the lack of whatever that people are saying. And I do try to do so much more things. The films, uh, the following films that I make are always trying to say or to talk about uh, identity, um, the stage plays that I put on are always trying to talk about, hey, who you are as a person, um, does it matter? We raise questions like that when you are, you know, looking for answers, um, asking yourself questions. Amelia Henderson, when she was 11 years old, today she's a beautiful 21 year old. Uh, this was back in, well, you know, 10 years ago. And um, I made this five jingo is actually like Glee, before Glee comes out, Glee comes out like maybe five years ago. If you do a YouTube quick search on, on Five Jinger, 
then you will read the comments that are horrible about this show. You learn. But I'm quite proud of what we did because it was really, really fun doing it. We had some really good fans following. This is the first interactive uh, format show ever on, on television where we put on the show and we asked people to decide on the ending of the show and the next day we will show a different ending based on whatever that you were showing. And this is back in the days where there's only SMS and there's nothing else. And we um, also talk about how whether it's important to have English name versus Chinese names, etc. etc. And I also made uh, Gang Bascola, which is a multiracial children uh, program and the same school bus solving crimes like Famous Five. Uh, those were um, stuff that I think was important to sort of like bring on changes in its own way. Talk about racial unity, etc. etc. But I didn't get to see the audience face. I didn't get to see how they feel after they see my show. I didn't get to see that, ah, something's different about you today because you've seen the shows that I've made. I didn't get that. We, I did not live in an era or this, this time then where you could read tweets, you could read hashtags, you just do a quick hashtag and you could find out what people say about the, the stuff that you do. And so it gets, again, very hollow. Again, I'm asking, how am I going to do this? I feel so alone in doing this, you know? What are the changes I'm trying to make? What am I trying to say? So perhaps it's time to get back into the box and not come out, or get back into the box and come out the other way. So the questions that I was constantly asking myself is, and I realized has always been about me. It's always been about how do I get this further? It's always I. And this word is such a heavy, heavy, horrible word because it's so self-centric. But for the life of me, until I was age 27, I couldn't shake it off. I couldn't. It, it, it's just so difficult to, to get it off me. It wasn't we. The we I used is still I. And it was only in the year 2005, um, 6, 7, that it became different for me. And it became different for me because I could finally let go of the baggage that I need to prove myself, that I need to, you know, bring on, I need to forget what people have, what people are looking, what people are seeing from me. I'm not living for them. Perhaps I need to work for them and not live for them. So that was some stuff that I realized in a very difficult way. And the choices that I make, as long as I remember that I need to make them because, not because they were easy to make, but because they were the right choices to make. Because it's the right thing to do. My half my face were completely paralyzed when I gave birth to my first first one, who 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 came out this elite and um, I was working, but but it was great. I, I love working till the time when I have to give birth, and I did that for all four of them. So, but it changed. When I had my first baby, that changed. The world is no longer about me, and that feeling was crazy. It, it was crazy. And when I decided to marry, settle down and, and, and have kids and all that, everybody was saying that, are you crazy? You know, you're at the peak of your career, you're making all these films, you're making all these TV shows, and, and you, you want to go get married? What? That doesn't mean I'm going to stop. Yes, but it's going to change your value and how much you are worth. I'm like, yeah, maybe it's not going to be about me anymore. And it's true. It is really about now I'm living as an example, as a role model for someone else. And that feeling has been crazy. It allowed me to take on completely different point of view. It allowed me to challenge myself again to like, hey, you know, what is it I don't know? What is it I don't like to do? Actually, I don't really like business. I, I think I'm really bad at business. I just want to do creative stuff. I don't like mathematics. I don't like finance. And then I tell myself, well, then you should go do that. And you should go do that very seriously. And so I did. I went and joined uh, Kapoor, 
which is the second largest retailer in the world back in 2008. And I was reporting to Paris, um, heading communications and marketing department for both Malaysia and Singapore. And I learned really difficult, like a fly on the wall most of the time, really difficult with tears and all, understanding peers, understanding politics, understanding how office work, understanding what matters, and then being able to contribute in that corporate environment. We were one of the first retailers to introduce um, uh, very strict changes about no plastic bags. We forced the government to make sure that happened. We were also one of the first to talk about how we could do sustainability in terms of marketing um, on the sales floor. We introduced a lot of different ways where we could cut wastage, and I'm proud of that. But at the end of it, again, I also feel that when you stop learning, that's when you need to start moving. Like I said, the one thing about turning into a butterfly, it doesn't really happen because you need to constantly be in that cocoon, constantly making sure you're uncomfortable because that's when you're learning. And that's when you're learning is the most uncomfortable time of your life. You should be enjoying that. So the trick here is to always enjoy the difficult moments all the time and to expect it and not when it is difficult, you go, ah, oh, it's too difficult. Let's go somewhere else or let's do something else. It's when it is difficult, you go, yeah, let's do it. Let's go on. It's the right path because it's difficult. Okay, I have friends who beg to defer because they think that, you know, if you can do it easy, why not? But I say that when you do it easy, you're not learning. So you could have learned. And to learn, it, have to, it has to be uncomfortable. And, um, and that's when I work in the corporate world and I decided also to, hey, check it out. Let's take over Kakisani, which is, a, which is a, a, an arts portal listing and getting all the arts, uh, artists in the country uh, to talk about their work, their closing down. And I thought to myself that, hey, you know, there's something I could do. I could take it over and do something. So that's exactly what we did. Uh, we changed the entire model of uh, Kakisani. Um, from just doing this thing and a portal for people to talk about, it's really about bringing access of the arts because the arts is not a main subject here in the education system. So you kind of have to like uh, 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 bring the arts to the people because it is not first of mind for people to like, oh, I want to go for a theater. It's not like that. It's really about, hey, this is happening right in front of me. It's really cool. Maybe I should go check out theater. So that's what we're trying to do a lot more. In terms of policy, we are trying to talk to different policymakers to get them to understand development work. It doesn't wait for someone to like, hey, I've got money now, let's do something. No. If there is no money, you still need to do the work. That's how it's going to be. So we have to be creative and figure out ways to try to make sure that we match everything um, uh, as much as we can. Uh, and we do that via a lot of different creative ways. We do different, different stuff corporately, whichever, make the money and then pump it back all the way in for children underprivileged so that they can learn some musical instruments because we think that that's highly more valuable um, when they learn a skill than, and to break the poverty cycle. And then I also, in this process, um, come across a lot of younger girls and I, because I'm in contact with them, I realized that when I talk to them, I realized that they, it's really very seldom for them to have conversations like this with women. And then that's when I discovered that I think what is missing is that women are forgetting that they themselves are role models every single day. Every single day, a little child, a little girl somewhere is looking at you thinking that, ah, when I grow up, I think I can be what she's doing. Ah. But if you go around saying no to opportunities, can you imagine what the little girl is learning? So one of the key things that we always say to women is that when you say no to opportunities, one day the decision maker, and chances are they're not, they're not women, they're men, will be saying that, guess what? There's 68% of students in a university, they're girls. But finally, at the very top decision-making position is only like, what, 18%. So why don't we do this? Why don't we just let 50% of girls go to Form 5 and then top 20% go to university? How's that? It saves us a lot of money, you know, we don't waste money. And finally, 20% anyway will end up uh, in, in, in those spots. So we are giving them chances and the rest of the women, well, they can do what they want to do, like getting married. 
is mathematics. Now that happens, may I ask, who is the culprit? So we go on ground and remind women every single day about this. The answer to uh, Rashmi's earlier question about uh, how each one of us actually do play a role is that you need to always think that you are a caterpillar in the cocoon. You have to make difficult decisions, even though the call is, ah, okay, you don't need to be at work, your, your child is waiting for you at home. But the point is, if you're making a contribution, even though you can't see it now, the contribution will make sense for the next generation. Do the right thing, not the easy thing. 21 minutes. Thank you.